also missing in Libya. The whereabouts of Iman al obedi and these women remains unknown. For more, we're joined by Mona El-Tahawi, a columnist who writes about Arab and Muslim issues. Mona, talk about the latest here and your own experiences uh, covering Libya in Libya. Well, Libya is one of those countries where, when you go as a journalist, you're really a prisoner of the Ministry of Information, as we've seen with the journalists who were roughed up in the hotel in Tripoli. I was there in 1996 with a group of journalists who were taken over from Cairo to Libya. And because I tried to escape from the minders and leave the hotel by myself, I was branded a troublemaker. And during a news conference with Gaddafi, one of his male guards twisted my nipple. In the middle of the news conference, I appealed to Gaddafi for help. He did absolutely nothing. And then I learned that other journalists heard them say, just shoot her. So th this is just an example of the kind of violence that the Gaddafi regime and the thugs from the Ministry of Information just kind of meet out, as we saw in the video. Now, what Iman and Abedi has done is really surmount unbelievable obstacles, because in Libya, Human Rights Watch issued a report in 2006 describing so-called social rehabilitation centers, where girls and women who are survivors of rape are taken. Because if you press charges for rape in Libya, you stand to, you know, just as we've seen these slander charges from the men she's accused of raping her, you could be arrested yourself. So these girls and women are taken to these so-called social rehabilitation centers, kept as virtual prisoners as a way of shaming them into silence. And they can't leave these centers unless their male relatives claim them or someone says he wants to marry them or their rapist marries them and then walks off free. So you can imagine what she had to surmount in order to say publicly that she was raped. And the fact that she's disappeared and we don't know where she is and all these bribes are offered to her family are just further signs of how the Gaddafi regime tries to silence women, either through sexual violence and then later shame. And what do we know about her or her history before uh, she appeared in the hotel? Well, she's an attorney. The Gaddafi regime, as we heard in your report, has tried to make her seem uh, either a, a drunk, mentally unstable or a prostitute. But her parents and her family, who I have to say, I mean, to their credit, they've been public in their support for her. So again, this goes against this tide of, you know, let's shame these women into silence. Her family has said she's an attorney. Her family have denied all the charges. And clearly the Gaddafi regime is trying to make, you know, it's trying to smear her because they can't believe that this woman has been so outspoken in, uh, in, in showing their violence, their sexual violence especially. The mother of Iman al Abidi uh, called on the youth of Tripoli to rise up against Gaddafi's regime. Muammar is the criminal. My daughter. She was mistreated by those criminals and cheaters, Muammar and his followers. Where are you, youth of Tripoli? Where are you? Iman was kidnapped in front of the camera. She was trying to appear to the world. She wanted to tell them what is happening in Misrata, Benghazi and the East. She wanted to reveal that. Where are you? She was kidnapped from your hands. Where are you? Make a move, youth of Tripoli. That was the mother of Iman al Abedi, uh, Mona al Tawi. And, you know, it, it's unbelievably moving to watch her family speak out. Her cousin has spoken out, her father, her mother. And, you know, and you have to tie all of this into, you know, the idea that we're very familiar with, unfortunately, of sexual violence being used as a weapon against women. I mean, in Egypt, my country of birth, we've heard of the female activists who were arrested from Tahrir Square on March 9th, who have since gone on record, again, on camera, speaking out without shame because they want to confront the, head on this idea of sexual violence and, and silence. How have said that the Egyptian military subjected them to virginity testing and threatened those who were found not to be virgins with being prostitutes. So it ties it in right to the story in Libya. You know, if you're not a virgin, you're a prostitute. If you speak out about rape, you're a prostitute. So I think it's very important that her mother has spoken out so movingly. And these revolutions and uprisings in, in across the Middle East and North Africa have really brought to the fore all this ugliness that regimes used against people. And clearly against women, they would use sexual violence. So that we're seeing more and more women speak out you know, on camera, in front of the international media, you know, clearly says that women will not be silenced anymore and that these regimes face a lot head on. Uh, Mona, you are Egyptian. Talk more about what women face in Egypt. I mean, even on the liberation night, the night of the tremendous celebration, the story of the CBS reporter, Lara Logan, we still don't know exactly what happened to her, but she was sexually abused in Tahrir. Right. Well, you know, sexual harassment in Egypt, street sexual harassment has been on the rise over the past few years. Uh, the levels are horrendous. You know, myself and 
every Egyptian woman I know have been subjected to groping or other kinds of street sexual harassment. And, you know, this is all a result of this growing conservatism in Egypt during the Mubarak regime, where the Mubarak regime would not only use an ultra-conservative interpretation of Islam against its Islamist opponents, but the regime itself sexually assaulted women. In 2005, again to silence and shame women activists and journalists, the regime's security forces and hired thugs would, would target women. Women showed their clothes that were ripped off. You know, women had headscarves ripped off, um, simulated rape on women journalists and activists as a way of getting women off the street. And so if the regime does that, then it's a green light that anyone, you know, women are fair game. So these are the obstacles in Egypt. And you saw it coming out on International Women's Day when women tried to march for women's rights. And, you know, what happened when Tahrir Square was opened was those who didn't join the revolution came out to Tahrir Square. So this kind of utopian atmosphere we had in Tahrir Square, you know, was, was ruined by people who came either from the Mubarak regime supporters or others who were not part of the revolution. So women in Egypt and their male allies recognize that the revolution must continue not just politically, but also culturally and socially as a way of ensuring that women's rights do not disappear just because the Mubarak regime has been toppled and that women must continue this fight along with their male allies. Well, you know, it, it's often been seen as uh, Saudi Arabia is perhaps the most misogynist nation in the entire region, although we're talking here rel relative. Yeah. Uh, but uh, do you see any signs of uh, any kind of movement developing within Saudi Arabia as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, Saudi Arabia had women revolutionaries back in the 1990s when 42 women got into their cars and staged a protest against the ban on driving. Now, and, and they were all arrested. And women they were driving. Women <laughs> driving, yeah. And, and they were called, again, prostitutes just because they dared to... to confront this ban. Now, the daughter of one of these women, several daughters actually of these women revolutionaries from the 90s, have themselves now taken part in this new campaign to gain more rights for Saudi women. Just a couple of days ago, officials said Saudi women would not be able to, to vote or run as candidates in upcoming municipal elections. So there are Saudi women now who are demanding that right. And one Saudi woman has launched a manifesto, which she calls the Saudi Women's Revolution. So even though we don't hear about it, Saudi women activists are definitely fighting for their rights. And you know, I salute them because they are fighting unbelievable ob uh, obstacles and odds there. Finally, do you think Iman al Abaidi is still alive? You know, I'm, I'm really worried for her safety. I, I, I would like to believe that she's alive. The fact that the Libyan regime is trying to bribe her family and say, if she retracts, will release her. Says to me she might be. But I really worry because we know what a thug Gaddafi is. And, you know, I, I hope we see her on TV soon. And I hope this, what she's done, you know, she's, she's like Mohammed Wazizi in Tunisia and Wa'il Ghanem in Egypt and all these other unbelievable young men and women who have become these icons of the demands for freedom and dignity in their country. So I salute her for shattering the silence. And I hope that it continues so that those brutal regimes no longer silence us with shame and sexual violence. Mona Altawi, thank you very much for being with us.